Welcome everyone to my podcast. I have Ricky Rivera on here today with Spectrum Canine. I'm sure a lot of you know who he is. Um, Ricky and I met in California in 2019. Um, the Hollister seminar in California <laughs> with Sean Siggins. It was an intro to PSA seminar. That was my debut into PSA. That was the first event I'd ever attended. Um, and I really enjoyed watching Ricky with Icon because at the time I wasn't, I wasn't really seeing many focus healing teams. Um, a lot of PSA still had, you know, the, the obedience wasn't as tight as, as it is today. So Ricky was always an inspiration for me in that way. Um, so yeah, we've known each other for a few years and we, we've talked every now and again since then. So it's a pleasure to have you on here. Kind of feels like everything came full circle. Tell us about your story and how you got into pet dogs and working dogs. So um, as a kid, as a young kid, I did 4-H. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with 4-H, but basically like a youth organization that uh, gets kids involved in like agriculture and science, I guess you can say. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff. They have like, you know, astrology and cooking and whatever. But obviously I was there for the animals because that was my thing and that's what I was into. And most 4-H clubs have like really cool projects like beef and horses and um, swine where you can raise a pig or a cow and then take it to fair and uh, you sell it. So, if, you know, whoever the buyer is and they make uh, and then you make money, you make profit off of it. Right. Oh, so that's the, so cool. I never heard of that. Yeah. So basically, like the whole the whole point of 4-H is like to get kids involved in agriculture. But anyways, I lived in the city, so we didn't have land to do any sort of what they call like the big projects like that, the big animal projects. So um, I got involved um, with raising chickens. So it's kind of weird. Like I started raising chickens and doing all this stuff with chickens and um, you know, going, believe it or not, there's like big poultry shows, just like there is dog shows that you go to. It's like the, it's the most fascinating thing ever. Um, uh, it's super weird. Um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then I, um, uh, got involved in a, the dog training project and, um, actually the guide dog raising project. So I got connected with a guide dog club, uh, in my city. And so basically what they do is they raise guide dogs from eight weeks old to a year, a, usually around a year period, um, give or take. And then they send them back to the guide dog organization. The guide dog organization does like the formal training. Um, it's like all the guide uh, tasks and service dog tasks and stuff like that. And then you uh, restart all over again. So I got involved in that. And then one day my 4-H club sent out an email and they were like, hey, like we're doing an AKC show. Um, I'm not sorry, we're uh, helping with an AKC show. They need uh, stewards. Stewards are like the people that help the judges in the ring. Like you, um, you know, t you take the handler's leash. It's just like a PSA steward, right? You take the handler's leash, you help keep the score, that sort of stuff, make sure all the paperwork's going well. And um, I decided to volunteer and go help out with the uh, AKC show. And when I was there, I saw a lady with a Belgian Traverin. And uh, at the time, I, ever since I was a little kid, my first, my parents always tell a story, like my first book was a dog breed encyclopedia, right? And I knew that thing like <laughs> back. And uh, my parents uh, always make fun of me because they were like, oh, like we could just point out a dog in public, you, even when you were like five years old and you'd be like, oh, that's a uh, blah, 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 and tell them what, right? So I saw a lady with the Belgian Traverin, and uh, I don't know what year this is, probably like 2014 or 2012, 20, somewhere from like 2012, 2014. And um, uh, so I saw this lady with the Belgian Traverin. I'm like, hey, um, is that a Belgian Traverin? And she's like, yeah, it is. How do you, how do you know that? And I was like, um, oh, like, you know, I, I like dogs, blah, 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 <laughs> uh, to compete at the show. And she was like, hey, like, I'm surprised you knew that. Like, not a lot of people know that, let alone people your age, because I was young. I was I know, 14 or I don't know how old. And, um, I was like, yeah, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in 4-H and I'm doing this, that, and the other, blah, blah. And she was like, oh, like I just started an online dog training school. Like you want a class, I'll let you do a class for free. And I was like, yeah, sure. And little did I know that I was in the presence of Denise Fenzi. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's how my relationship started with Denise. And really she kind of like taught me a lot of stuff and jump started me from there. I started helping her with her online um, dog sport academy doing like video editing for their website um and a bunch of stuff like that that's and, awesome yeah and then it kind of just went from there so she uh let me use her uh belgian turver and reka for detection uh competition so we were competing in nacsw 
And uh, yeah, it was, that's kind of what kicked it off. Uh, that's my, I guess, introduction to formal dog training and my introduction into dog training in general. So. so you were actually showing the chickens when you were in that program? Yes, I have pictures. I'm sure you've seen the pictures every- I year. haven't seen the pictures, but I'm gonna need you to send me something. Every year for my birthday, uh, people come out of the woodworks and I'm, like wearing a hat and like my boots and my big buckle and like, <laughs> white pants because you have to wear like you have to wear white in order to stay clean uh because the whole thing is like it's all about presentation and professionalism so if you have an animal obviously you, you don't want to wear all white because it's easy to get dirty so that's the whole point is like they want to see how 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 you're able to keep yourself clean and presentable while presenting an animal um but anyways so interesting I, yeah i have all these pictures of me like holding my chickens like this like with a big old smile on my face and every year for my birthday someone someone come through the woodworks and post a photo. It's so embarrassing. So you started off with working dogs, ironically, because most people, I think, start the other way around. So how did you get into pet dog training? Yeah, it kind of just went into each other. It is kind of weird because a couple things uh, is weird and against the grain, I guess you can say. I feel like um, a lot of people that are crossover trainers, and I'm talking about now like balance versus whatever you want to call it, positive only training, uh, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, people have all sorts of names for it, but... Um, I, it, it's weird because I started, um, using, uh, how do I word this? I started my dog training career, not using aversives at all. So I learned dog training without the use of aversives. Um, and I also learned competition dog training first. So it was a little bit weird. I feel like it's against the grain. Usually, like you said, it's the other way, right? So usually mm -hmm. you start off like, not only do they start off with the pet dogs, but they also start off with balanced training. Yeah. Um, and then maybe transition later into, you know, positive only, whatever you want to call it, dog training. So for me, it was the complete opposite of what people normally do. And basically what happened is I was, you know, getting involved in competition dog training and uh, people see that. And it's more like usually, I think it was like, I guess my parents, I never really thought about this, but I'm assuming like my parents be like, oh, like Ricky, Ricky can train dogs. Like, let him help you with your dog. Like, <laughs> oh, here, who, who uh, you know, Bobby got a puppy. Like, you should go help them with their puppy. It's kind of that sort of thing. And then it just turns into... Uh, a way that I was able to make money to support my competition dog training stuff. So it kind of went, that's kind of, how I got into pet dogs, I guess. I never really thought about it, but that's really anybody that trains dogs knows that the, the money in dog training is in the training of pet dogs and the training of everyday dogs. Right? Oh yeah. You learn really quickly. Like you have to do it. It's, it's a, it's a must, right? Yeah. It's funny that you brought that point up because that's something that Shrod and I have like really started to shift gears gears towards in the last year or two, um, because we were both, I would say, more passionate about working dogs. But again, I mean, we were we started to notice we were putting a lot of energy into our canine program, trying to you know build detection dogs and try to work start working with departments and stuff like that. That you know our pet dog side of the business was overflowing and we weren't giving it as much time as we should have for the demand i know you've mostly been doing police dogs but obviously you still do pet dogs too so tell us about that yeah i think it's funny you said that because i was just thinking about this the other day i think the the dog world because the dog world only sees what we put out on social media so i think the dog world sees steve my business partner and i only doing police dogs but in reality they don't see how many pet dogs we're training on the back end right for every yeah. police dog that i'm that i train there's five pet dogs that i'm training still right so right now um yesterday yesterday actually we just wrapped up our patrol dog course so we our handlers course we did uh five new police dogs um so we, we i'll go into this a little bit later but we just finished up our handler course we Throughout the handler course, it's a Monday to Friday thing. So we're, you know, training these brand new police dogs, brand new canine handlers um, throughout these eight weeks. And then I am stuck shoving all my pet dog clients every weekend, right? So my weekends are jam packed. It's basically eight weeks of work every single day because my days are, my Monday to Friday is jam packed with pet dogs. I mean, sorry, with police dogs. And then my Saturday and Sunday are completely packed with private lessons. Um, or board and train go homes or whatever it is. And then, you know, I'm fitting in little random stuff in between like a competition client or a detection dog sweep, that sort of stuff. So those are like, it's a bunch of, we're doing a bunch of shit, but all we're posting on social media is the pet, the police dogs, because at the end of the day, that's what I think we enjoy the most. Yeah. And, uh, that's what I guess we're known for at this point. I feel like that's what I'm known for. Like, oh, Ricky, the police dog trainer. Yeah, right? I, I definitely agree. 
yeah so it and i think i kind of created that for myself um and it's kind of sucks because i think i think uh <laughs> i think a lot of people don't I, I don't really care about other dog trainers but i think a lot we probably scare away a lot of you know pet dog clients because all they see on our social media is police dogs there's like the 50 percent of people that are like oh that's cool they train police dogs like if they can train police dogs they can train my pet dog in german yeah and there's the other <laughs> in german <laughs> and there's 50 percent of people that is like oh my god they train police dogs like that that's not my type of dog i need someone that's that is is gentle and can train my yeah dog, right so um yeah but like you know we're we're impacted with pet dogs so it's not like it's scaring away enough people to make it that big of a deal and to be honest i i personally feel like in our area um people aren't really like going on social media to look for a pet dog we live in a very professional uh in you know environment of the world it's the silicon valley everybody talks about the silicon valley it's the tech capital of the world um so i think in our in our area people are mainly using like Google and, you know, that sort of thing to look for like dog training for your meat, right? So that's yeah. kind of how I market uh, my specific, my pet, my pet dog services in the place that we live in, right? So I've, I've tried a lot of like Instagram ads and Facebook ads and it just doesn't work well in this uh, environment that I'm in, right? But Google, Google ads and anything that looks like professional um is like skyrocket google yelp that sort of thing. if you have someone with like a small dog like a little shih tzu or maybe someone who has a doodle and sees that your you know your dogs are biting all over instagram they're just kind of like how is he gonna help me yeah um, I, I always um, joke, and i train the i tell the, my pet dog clients i'm like yeah i train dogs to not bite during the day like pet dogs like you know <laughs> aggressive dogs and then i train dogs to bite at night and they always, yeah. <laughs> if you can train one, I think you should be able to train the other. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think people that do both, I think that people are in the working dog scene and then also do pet dog trainers are the best trainers because they just have a much broader understanding of dog behavior, genetics yeah. and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny you said that. Cause I always think about this. Uh, one thing that Bart Bellin talks about um, and you can find his like old videos on YouTube where he mentions this. He's like, oh, I always train opposites. He, and he's talking about his dogs, right? Like he, he, and, and, and what he does, if you're going to teach a dog to walk forward, also teach him to walk backwards. Right. Mm -hmm. always train opposites. But I look at it, I, I always took that and I was like, well, as a dog trainer, you should be able to train those opposites too. Like if you can yep. train a dog to bite, you can train a dog to not bite. Right. If you can train a dog to bark, then you should be able to train a dog to not bark. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's kind of like the, the little motto in my head that I've always followed in, in my dog training career is, I sh is you should be able to train both sides of it. Yeah, I think that's a good perspective. And I also think it could keep it interesting because just constantly doing the same things with the same kinds of dogs could just become really repetitive. So a little a little spice here and there, and then also just training a dog how to sit or walk on a leash can, can kind of give you a, a mental break or if you perceive it that way. Yeah, um, absolutely. And like, I, I was just, it's funny you said that because I was just talking to my buddy, um, Marco Arroyo, he's a dog trainer. His company's called Panoramic Canine in Salt Lake, I mean, in uh, Oklahoma City. And he, uh, I was telling him, like, it, throughout my, you know, 10 year dog training career at this point, or my 10 years into dogs, um, I've had constant shifts, like, you know, and there's been years where I'm like, or months where I'm like, oh, yeah, board and trains. I want board and trains right now. And there's months where like, I don't want board and trains. I just want private lessons. <laughs> Right, and then there's there's been months where I'm like I'm not doing pet dogs this month. I'm just gonna put some police dogs and vice versa, right? So I think that's what's what's cool is you're 100% right. You got to keep life interesting and having your your hands in so many different or having my company in so many different aspects of dog training or different sort of dog training has been you know awesome and has been a it's been the best thing that possibly could have happened to me because I can basically pick and choose what I want to do based on yeah. what, what I'm, I'm not stuck. I'm not, you know, ball and chain to one, one specific dog training thing. If I want to do competition, I can do competition. If I want to go on a stint of doing detection, I can do a stint of doing detection. If I, like right now I'm on a private lesson kick. I have a lot of private lesson clients. I love my private lesson clients. I'm filming it all. I'm uh, putting it on Patreon. Like that's my thing right now is, is the private lessons, right? So uh, it, I think it's really cool. And I know that you guys are on the same page is like you can pick and choose what you want to do based on how you feel and keep it interesting. And I think that's, that's important. I think a lot of, a lot of dog trainers don't do that and they get stuck on, you know, like, okay, here I go. Another private lesson, another board and train, another, you know, 
So I you got to keep it interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to get burnt out as a dog trainer. You have to try to really do the best that you can to avoid things like that. I agree. I agree with you a hundred percent. And I, I, I don't, I think people think I'm like bullshitting when I say this, but I, I luckily I've never really been burnt out. And I think it's the ability to be able to switch back and forth from different stuff and never locking myself down to one specific piece of the dog training world has been able to help me avoid that burnout. Avoid that. Okay. Yeah. So when people talk about like dog trainer burnout, I'm like, I, I honestly, I can't, I can't relate. <laughs> I can't relate too much. Like I see where I see, I see it. Like I can yeah. see it's possible, but I can't relate because of that. And I think, that's, I don't know if it's just, I got lucky. That's the way I set up my company or, uh, I, I was maybe, maybe I was smart about it or, you know, things just fell into place, but luckily I've been able to avoid, you know, the dog trainer burnout that everybody talks about. Yeah. Cause you get more flexibility and freedom when you run things that way. And when you're knowledgeable in so many different aspects, because it, you know, allows clients in multiple different avenues. And the other thing too, is like you said, one month, maybe you want to do board and trains the next month you want to do private lessons. I've always been someone who prefers board and trains over private lessons just because it allows me the flexibility during the day to train dogs on my own schedule. I usually do do lessons. When I first started training, I did way more lessons than I do now. Um, but I'm kind of starting now that I have the baby, I'm kind of starting to like, all right, maybe it's time for some private lessons because as you know, and as anyone who takes board and trains home knows, you're working on the clock 24-7. Right. Um, you never get a break. And when you have to worry about client dogs. It's just a constant thought in your brain. It's like, you're going to run to Starbucks to get coffee and you're like, I have cameras and stuff like that, but I don't even really like leaving the house that much when I have board and trains. Um, you know, and then if I do go to club, I have to bring them with me because I'm not comfortable leaving them for an entire day Absolutely. at home by themselves. So then I'm taking time away from my sport dogs at club because you know, maybe this board and train shit themselves, or I have to go rotate these dogs, or the dog is super aggressive and is trying to kill everyone walking by. So it, it could be a lot, especially if someone has your sport goals too. Like, have you taken a step back from sport? Do you plan on continuing in PSA? Do you plan on showing in the threes or maybe just switching gears? What are your goals for that? Yeah. So, um, my dog icon struggles a little bit, no, a lot of it <laughs> with the muzzle work in PSA. And, uh, I've always had aspirations of doing many sports with him. He's getting older. He just turned six in October. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. Time is flying. I know time is flying and, uh, it's just time is ticking. And for me, it's like, okay, am I going to sit here and focus on improving his muzzle work and, you know, spend the next two or three years building him with his muzzle work for the threes because the muzzle is very important. I feel like even in these past few years, the muzzle has become even more important in the threes mm -hmm. more than ever. Um, and I, it just, it's not worth the battle for me at this point. And he is an excellent Schutzen dog as well. He has really nice aggression in his barking and he has really nice, calm, methodical tracking. And obviously his obedience is pretty good as well. So uh, right now our focus is on Schutzen and titling Ms. Schutzen. We just got our BH uh, this past month. So uh, we're we're kind of full steam ahead on the Schutzen train. I want to title him in Schutzen and then possibly look at doing some Mondial ring or French ring just based on whatever comes about. Um, you know, my goal was always to triple crown him and title him to the, to, to the, the highest level in Schutzen PSA and one of the rings. And uh, I don't think we'll get there with PSA or at least as of right now. Um, but I do look forward to titling him in those other sports as well. Um, my original dog sport, I guess you can say, or my original bite sport was Schutzen. So it's kind of nice to come back full circle to Schutzen. Um, I was a training director for the Schutzen club in our area for like three or four years. And uh, I've been a helper since 2016, a certified USCA helper. So it's nice to kind of come full circle and go back to Schutzen since we've been playing in PSA for the last, you know, four years or so. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. I'm, I'm, I'm just focusing on getting back into the Schutzen groove, getting up early and going tracking and doing all that sort of shit <laughs> you don't have to do in PSA. Um, what I do like about Schutzen is it's a little bit more, it's, it's more of an individual sport. So you can get a lot more done individually, where if you're playing in the upper levels of PSA, you need a 
gang of decoys. Yeah. Want to help you with scenarios. You need some. You need to. You need someone to be constantly testing you. Um, so it just requires a lot more work because it's not. You're not only working around your personal schedule, but you're also working around the schedule of your of your team, right? So yeah. Um, you can. I think you could definitely get a dog to a PSA one or for sure a PDC without much, you know, outside help. But and I did. I was able to title him with. I was able to get his PDC. And his first leg of his one um, in the same weekend, uh, traveling to North Carolina for the first time when I first titled him with very little help from anybody else, just a decoy and myself and maybe another body. But uh, when you're playing like in the threes, even the twos, but for sure the threes, it's no joke. Um, and you need to have a, you need to be working around your team schedule because they're a necessary piece. They're a necessary piece of training for that level right so um yeah i mean that's kind of where we're at right now um definitely excited to see what what we're what we're going to do with him this year and hopefully close out his titles in Schutzen this year yeah i'm excited to see you do some igp i knew that you did helper work i didn't know that you were a certified helper i knew that you started an igp though because i remember a few years ago um you got a shepherd I don't remember if it was just like one or two, but I remember you posting about a shepherd. I remember being like, oh, ha ha, ha. like, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the, to the shepherd gang. Because uh, yeah, Amal was your first working dog, right? Was Icon your first working dog or no? Uh, I had another. Um, so there, I, my first, I guess, personal working dog was, um, I called her Yo-Yo, but her name is Yoshi now. She's at South Bay Malinois. She's one of the breeding females that they have. Um, so that was my first working dog. Um, I guess you can say, um, and then, but I would say like Icon was my first serious working dog that I titled. I titled two or three dogs before that in Schutzen. Um, but Icon's the first dog that I've, you know, put all my time and effort to and, you know, committed to, and he's going to live out his life with me type of thing. So do you plan on getting another puppy anytime soon, or that's not something that you're interested in? Uh, you know, for the longest time, it's not been something I'm interested in. But, uh, I mean, he's six years old. He's going to be seven next year. Like, for me, I've always said that uh, a dog trainer's resume is their personal dog or, you know, what they can achieve with with, a, with their personal dog. And so in order to keep my money where my mouth is, I <laughs> I do need to start looking at my next dog. So I'm assuming that at the end, maybe this year, 2024, 2025, um, that I'll probably be adding my, or at least looking for my next personal dog. Um, if anybody knows me, they know I'm pretty picky when it comes to dogs. So I'm assuming I'm probably going to try out quite a few dogs before <laughs> I find the one that matches, but, um, I'm definitely, it, it's a focus of mine now at this point. So you're going to get a Mal, I assume. Uh, I don't really care. Um, I'm uh, definitely more of a Malinois Dutch shepherd type of person, but, you know, I, I, I'm not breedist if the right <laughs> about, and it's something else, you know, I would definitely be interested in it. There's a, actually, there's a dude out here named Vic <clears throat> and he has a black bulldog type of thing mix that he's doing PSA with. And that dog is really nice. And I shit you not, I would a hundred percent own that dog and work. <laughs> that dog. Um, he's super intense. He has nice grips. Um, but he's like, I don't, I don't know, pit bull bulldog. I don't know exactly what, I think he's a pit bull. I don't know what he is, but he's <laughs> very nice. Um, but th that dog, I'd probably, I probably would work that dog. But uh, for the most part, it's probably going to be a Melon or a Dutch Shepherd for sure. Dipping your toes into the pitties. Um... No. Just, <laughs> it's okay. Just... <laughs> so what are the best parts about training police dogs? Uh, I think the, the best part about training police dogs is putting work into an animal or putting work into an animal on a handler and it proving itself in a, in real life over and over again. So um, we have five dogs in our handler course right now, or that finished yesterday. And uh, two of those dogs already had their first uh, deployment and engagement on suspect. Hey. Yeah. And uh, they both were super successful, um, completely successful in both uh, situations. Um, so that's really nice to see. Um, it's pretty cool. I, I take it like this, like in sport dog training, right? You put time and effort into this animal, you put a bunch of training to your animal, and then your test day is you go out onto the field on competition day and see where it goes. Right. Um, for police dogs, 
that they get tested every day, every night, you know, and constantly. And you, the cool thing is you don't know when that test is coming, right? So your dog's got to be ready all the time. So I think my favorite part about training police dogs is the fact that your your work is constantly getting put to the test and there's unlimited factors, unlimited variables and no rules behind it. Right. So what I mean by that is in PSA, like, you know, like, okay, in level two, you know, the, the decoy can only have plastic distractions, no water, no metal, like, you know, I'm not making it up. I don't know if that's uh PSA two or PSA one. Right. But in police dogs, it's like, yeah, the distraction is going to be, you know, what it could be the craziest shit in the world. There is no rules. And that could happen day one that the dog's done with our handler course and goes out to the street. Right. So the way our, sh our program is structured is we procure the dog for the department. We match the dog with the handler. The department gives us a handler. We procure a dog. We match them together. Um, they go through an eight week course with us where at the end of the eight weeks, they're fully off leash trained for patrol and uh, fully trained in detection. So whether they're doing narcotics, guns, explosives, and then they go out onto the street literally the next day and we see them weekly for their entire career. So we train them four hours a week for their entire career. And so what's cool is we can basically, you know, tweak training and tweak um, all the, all basically we're able to see them and maintain them and build them for the rest of their career. I think that's just, that's the part I can't get over. That's super neat is the, 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 what if, or the, we don't know what this dog's going to encounter, but hopefully they're ready. Right. And, um, you know, we've been pretty successful so far and we're constantly, constantly tweaking and changing our program based on what we're seeing happen on the street. Um, I always, Steve and I always joke about this, but every six months we look back at what we were doing six months prior and we're like, yeah, we thought we were hot shit and <laughs> we were not, like, we weren't doing this, that, and this, that makes us that much better. Right. So, um, you know, that's one thing that you can't deny is the experience and the, um, lessons that people who have been training police dogs for X amount of years have. Right. So when people, you know, I always joke and say like, Oh man, here we go. We got someone saying like, I've been training dogs for 30 years, for 25 years, for 20 It's years. always those people. Right. It's always those people. But, and, and, you know, usually their, their dog training is whatever, but I can't deny the experience that they have being a police officer on the street and working their dog and seeing shit. Like they definitely have an advantage over us because of their real life experience. Yeah. Now their dog training might not be the best, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that, that is one thing that you can't deny is like the shit that you see, right? Like I, the, the shit that our police dogs have gone, gone through at this point, you know, five years ago, I would have never even thought like one of our dogs would go through that. You know what I mean? We've had dogs be on bite, um, while the suspect, you know, produces a gun and, and is shot by officers. We've had, um, you know, crazy suspects try to do jujitsu on our dogs. Literally there's a dude that was, that did jujitsu and was trying jujitsu moves on our dog, grappling our dog on the ground while it was on bite. Um, we, we've had all sorts of crazy stuff and it's, is I can't get over how fun it is basically putting time and effort into, into an animal and seeing it work out in real life. That, that feeling is, is a feeling that I can't describe, you know, like when you get a phone call or a text from a handler at three in the morning and they're like, you know, Fido just, uh, you know, got an engagement. Like he did super good. Um, it was awesome. Like that, that's, that's really cool to hear. And there's no better, there's no, you know, high in trial, you know, champion <laughs> season trophy or ribbon or certificate or anything that can, that makes me more happy than, than that, than getting that call from a canine handler. Right. So, um, and like I said, this, we, it's, it's totally a, a fluke. This has never happened before, but we had two dogs get their first engagements on their first deployments right out of our, or during our patrol school before it was even over. And that was like pretty awesome because our, our, our record prior to that was the first day off of, of school, out of school. Um, we're literally first shift dog goes and gets his, his, his first fight. Um, but this time it was, you know, nine days before school was over and they <laughs> need a dog. The dog was already certified. It just had nine days of training left. And we were like, Oh, I guess go ahead. And boom, they, they go, one of them goes and gets a bite in the next day or a couple of days later, the next one goes and gets a bite. So that was, 
that is neat and I can't get over that and I don't know if I'll ever be able to get over it. Yeah, that's so awesome. I mean, the real life stuff, it can never beat, like you said, the trophies and the ribbons of just a sport dog. Um, I started with personal protection training and then eventually got into sport. So I always found that the real life stuff was a lot more fulfilling, I guess. And I just like more practical training. I do love sport, but I just think that, you know, dogs who are actually going out there saving lives every day, saving the lives of their officers, you know, their fellow fellow officers and, and getting the bad guys is a lot more than, you know, yelling at your PSA dog to run downfield and get the bad guy. Yeah. Um, not to take anything away from sport dogs. I mean, PSA is my main thing, but you know, and same thing, even this is just a small example, but John, uh, John trained a bomb dog. We had this really, really nice female. Um, her name is Ember. She was an explosives dog and we ended up selling her to a home that does PSA with her, does detection, all that stuff. But she took her to the, um, I don't know where she took her. She took her to some kind of store that sells like that sold gardening stuff. And I guess in some kind of fertilizer, there was some kind of component and Ember on her own alerted to that when she was just walking around in the store. Um, so that was just by chance. So I thought that was super, that was super. I agree with you not to take anything away from sport because I always tell people like, Hey, your sport dog can do way cooler shit than our police dogs can, right? Like our police dogs just, they can basically down sit, go and bite and recall. And that's it. Like, <laughs> not, it. There's nothing cool that they can do. Right. So, uh, uh, the testament to the true dog training stuff is definitely in PSA where you're teaching your dogs a bunch of different behaviors and asking them to do it in a bunch of different situations. So definitely not to take anything away from sport at all whatsoever. So this kind of just brings us right into our next point. And I think it's funny because I'm sure I didn't realize four hours a week of training for the rest of the, the dog's career. That's crazy. I've never seen a department that does it. I'm, maybe there's some more out there, but that's a lot of police dogs, which obviously you would know way better than me, are not trained to the level to which they really should be to be out on the streets. Um, like the other day, I mean, I see videos on TikTok all the time of canines that are completely out of control. They're not outing and then it becomes a lawsuit and situations like those are why some states are trying to do away with police or, you know, patrol dogs. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is really lacking in regards to the training that police dogs get? And to piggyback off of that, do you think that they should know a formal out? Are you using training tools? Like just give me all, all that stuff. Yeah. So, oh, um, the state of California recommends that dogs get 16 hours of training a month. So, um, and it's a strong recommendation, right? So most departments want to fit that recommendation because it makes them look better. So that's what helps me. The other thing that helps me out is in our part of California, Northern California, I guess you can say, um, it is industry standard to have your police canines trained by an outside vendor that's a professional dog trainer. In the past few years, I've been traveling a lot, training all over the country. I just did... Um, a seminar in Indiana. I did a seminar or a conference in Indiana. I did a conference in Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been traveling around a lot more. And what I've learned traveling is that a lot of places you go to a handler course for a couple weeks and then they kick you to the curb and they're like, Hey, good luck. You're ready. You're certified. You're good to go. And then it's on the handler for the rest of their career. Right. Mm -hmm. That's complete bullshit because their title is canine handler not trainer. Their job is not to train their dog. Their job is to handle their dog. And the idea that a canine handler needs to be turned, that needs to be their own dog trainer is a little ridiculous for me because this, both you and I and everybody else that's a dog trainer knows how much time it takes to get into dog training and how much time it takes to actually learn and be able to process information in dog training. And the idea that a canine handler goes to a couple weeks of formal training by someone that probably doesn't even know what the fuck they're doing themselves and then kick to the curb and their life depends on this animal. And they are now expected to train that animal completely on their own and problem solve that animal on their own is fucking ridiculous. And I always, uh, my canine handlers are simply canine handlers. If they have a problem, they're calling me and they're like, Hey, my dog won't blah, 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 blah. My dog is blah, 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 blah. What do I do? Cause that is my job. My job mm -hmm. is to solve for them. You know, I've trained thousands of dogs. This is their one, right? And um, that is my job to do all the problem solving for them. I don't expect them to do any of the problem solving themselves. 
Um, I do expect them to put time and effort into their animal, but I don't expect them to problem solve. So I think that's that's the main issue in this industry is the fact that people in this industry aren't relying upon professional dog training to get problems across, right? And luckily there's a lot of good information being put out online now. There's a bunch of people, um, you know, big name people, Carlos Ramirez, Mike Nesbeth, Cameron Ford, all these people in this industry that are able to travel now. And, you know, there's big, there's organizations like Cannons United putting on free training for police officers all over the country. And that's great because they're finding yeah. that, that, that they need, some of the info that they need. But I really think that uh, administration at police department police departments needs to look at their shit and be like, yo, like, what are we doing? Like, do we really expect this canine handler to problem solve this, this issue by themselves? Like that's, that's total bullshit. So like a couple steps back, like I said, I'm lucky that in our area, that's industry standard. So here pretty much any canine program is completely run by a third party vendor. And I think that puts out better quality training than, you know, a cop trying to train their own dog or, a, a cop that's handled two or three police dogs and has been doing it for X amount of years is now running the training group. Like that's mm, not, yeah. not very salt. Like, yeah, he's trained two or three dogs. I trained that in a couple hours. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like that. Uh, I think one thing that I see in police work in, in law enforcement is the fact that they'll take a canine handler and that canine handler will be really successful with his dogs, his dogs, because his dog or dogs, because they had X amount of bites. They had X amount of deployments. They had X amount of tracks. They found X amount of pounds of drugs. They found X amount of cash right on the streets. And they're like, Oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Like, let's listen to him. Right. Mm -hmm. As no, that, that, that's not how this works. That the yeah. amount of deployments that someone had with their one, two, maybe three dogs does not translate to them being a good police dog trainer. It's similar to, you know, an officer that's been in five or six officer involved shootings. That doesn't mean he's a good shooter, right? Uh, that's not how this works. And I think in, in law enforcement, that's a big misunderstanding is like, oh, well, you know, he had 150 bites in his career. So like, you know, he, know, he knows what the fuck's up, right? Like he knows what he's doing. That's not that's not how this works, right? That 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 completely goes against the ideology of a dog trainer that's put their hands on thousands of dogs, a shooting instructor that's put their hand that's taught, you know, this many people to shoot and can actually go out on a to a competition and perform the way he put his money where his mouth is, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest issue that I see. And that does translate over into, you know, the whole control portion. Um as I've traveled around the country, I've learned, and even in my local community, I've learned that people don't think of robots and warrant because they think that it's totally, completely acceptable to go up and choke the dog off. And that is acceptable in certain situations, right? The big thing when it comes to police work and tactics is that there's no wrong or right. Um, there's no, there's no absolutes in police work. Um, it's a very, every situation is different. Every situation is fluid. And I think it's important that the handlers have options. So my canine handlers all have at least, at least five options to get their dog off the bite, right? They can verbal out their dogs from a distance. They can go up and physically take their dog, you know, stop the blood flow to their dog's head and, and, and choke them off, right? They can um, use a breaker bar. They can use a handcuff. They can use their actual hand to make the dog let go. Um, they can go up and grab the dog by the collar and what we call a tactical out where they grab the dog off by the collar and, and then give them a verbal out command, right? There's so many options that my canine owners have. And that's my job as a dog trainer is to give them all those options to remove their dog, right? But I think so, in so many parts of this country, canine handlers only have one or two options. And typically those options are you go and you stop the dog's blood flow to their head and take and, and, you know, physically remove them off the bite or use a breaker bar. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, those are good options, but that's just it. They're options. If you are a police canine handler and you don't have the ability to call your dog from a distance, then you're fucked up. Right. There's yeah. something wrong. Um, and I do believe that your dog, you know, should have a blow. And if you, you know, people can argue with me all they want. Um, I can't tell you how many times people tell me like, oh, well, you know, we want to go up and, you know, if we take the dog, off, if we call the dog back, the guy might get up and run again. Okay. So you send your dog again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, if, if, you, for me, it's important to give my handlers as many options as possible and they should have the ability to be behind a point of cover. So be behind something that will eat a, a, a bullet if it's shot towards them and control their dog from there. Right. Um, and that's my job as a, as a police dog trainer is to 
you know, make sure that their dog can fulfill all those options. And people always want to argue about like, oh, you know, I don't want the dog to come off before the guy's handcuffed. Like, yeah, that's fine. It, it's situational dependent, right? But there are situations where you should should be calling your dog off from a distance and calling that guy back to you all behind a point of cover completely safe. And you can argue all you want. LAPD has been doing it since 1990s. And, you know, they, you know, probably average somewhere between 80 to 100 bites a year. And pretty much every single one is a verbal out and a recall back. And they're very safe, right? Um, our two canine handlers that just got bites last week and they're uh, in while they were still in handler course, both verbal out and recalled their dog from a point of cover. Um, and the dogs had quality engagements um, and the dogs also verbal out and came back. So it's not there like every excuse that's been given to me is you know, able to trump with we've been there done that right it's, yeah and if and if i haven't been there and done that you know an agency like lapd that you know gets 300 to 500 deployments a year has um so that's the big thing too is a lot of people are like oh well you're not a cop so you don't understand right okay cool that's fine you tell that to lapd right like they <laughs> been a canine handler for 20 years and probably has 5,000 deployments under his belt. And, you know, you, you can, if you don't want to, you, you can argue with me all you want, but you can't argue with him. He's got the numbers and the experience to trump that. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I kind of get all fired up with this conversation because it's a big, it's a big thing for me. It's like, how, why am I arguing with a cop right now about whether or not their dog should out and recall back to them on a real bite like that. The fact that people even argue that to me is <laughs> uh, yeah. Just, I don't. I just don't like when people have to rely on using a brake stick or rely on choking the dog off because I just think it's so inefficient and the lack of training that some departments are giving to their canine handlers and the canines themselves just puts the dog and the officer at a huge risk. Absolutely. Um, you you should absolutely be able to to out your dog verbally. I mean, again, I don't even understand why it's a conversation. Like, again, situ depending on the situation, do you need to have your time? Maybe not, but if you tell your dog to out, they should out. One of the videos that I was just referring to, which again, there's a million, this is just one out of all the ones that I'm sure you see all day too, is the officer was screaming at his, his dog to plots. He was still on the bite. There was no outcome or anything. He was just saying plots, plots, plots dog wasn't plotting the people in the comments were just so funny they're like oh they're telling his dog plots you know to come back like thinking the dog's name was plots and i'm just like you guys just you know a lot i just think that they make other departments look bad and the other thing too is um i've just seen so many well this will kind of go into another question but like there's so many dogs that so many canines on the street that have only bitten like a schutzen sleeve and i'm just yeah. like how did we how did we get here they're right. like popping off of an IGP sleeve. It makes no sense. Um, and, yeah. and I think, right. And that's another thing is like, here I am trying to do this, like, you know, whole battle on, on verbal outs and why you should have verbal control or when there's fucking hell of canine handlers all around the country that can't even get their dog to engage. And I'm here trying to talk about verbal outs and they can't even get their dog to, you can't out if your dog doesn't in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and for me, like that, that that is another piece. That's what's so hard about teaching what I teach is that most people, not most, but a lot of people aren't even ready for that. Um, you know, I can't. Eat, I'm I'm trying to preach all this out shit, but I, I how am I going to preach this when there's no in? And that <laughs> part that gets me uh, that that pisses me off even more. And you're 100 percent right. Like there's you know there there is no room. If you're a police cannon handler and you're even using a Schutzen sleeve, you're fucking, you're lost, bro. The only time we use a Schutzen sleeve is for shedding drills. I shit yeah. you know, the only time we use a Schutzen sleeve. And that's pretty much the only time you should be using a Schutzen sleeve. So if you're a police cannon handler and you're even using a Schutzen sleeve in the first place, like you're so behind, right? And that's what's hard about doing what I do is, you know, I'm over here talking about outs and they're like, barely just trying to get their dog to engage. So it is frustrating. It is difficult. It is hard, um, you know, being the, the verbal out guy or being the control. Guy. <laughs> You're the verbal out guy. That, that's how it is. Like we're at, when I go people place people, like, Oh, I like the verbal out guy. 
Oh, oh, there's Ricky. Now our dogs have to out. How are you proofing your canines? What equipment, you know, lack of equipment? What's your process there? Yeah, we do a fuck ton of muzzle work. I think that's very important. That is a so there's a couple things that we focus on in order to proof our police dogs. Number one is we want to make sure we proof them off equipment, and we're definitely using a muzzle for that sort of thing uh, the most. Um, we're also, we also want to proof the dogs. We want to make sure they're not a hundred percent comfortable. They're not only comfortable biting suit material or material that they're comfortable with in their mouth. So in order to do that, we use prosthetics. Um, so we do use the prosthetics once in a while in order to make sure that the dog is comfortable feeling new. In their mouth. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you, there's these old Michael Ellis videos and there's one about him raising a puppy or starting play with a puppy. And he talks about how he uses a, a lot of different tug styles with his puppies to get them comfortable with new. And I'll, I always remember this because Michael Ellis videos are one of the first, you know, videos that I watched early on in my dog training career. And he talks about how he uses a jute, uh, uh, tug and a synthetic tug and a leather tug and all these different tugs in order to make sure that his dog is not only satisfied with one feeling or sensation in his mouth that he's mm -hmm. going and I kind of take that, I took that and shifted it over to our police dogs. And I'm like, I want to make sure that they're comfortable feeling, feeling something new. Um, because I think everybody tries to mimic skin, but instead of mimicking skin, what I'm trying to do is just get a dog that's comfortable with new. That way, when he feels something new on the street, it's not like, oh, I've never felt this before. It, uh, the dog's always going to be like, oh, I've never felt this before. But what I want from them is like, yeah, but I feel new shit all the time. And I always just do the same thing. So I'm just going to do that with this, right? Yeah. So we do the prosthetics, we do um, bites with tarps, we do bites with different type of like sheets, we do types with different like thickness of tarps, different type of plastic, like always the dog biting both the suit and the prosthetic and the hidden sleeve with those materials over it so that we're proofing different sensations in the mouth, we're proofing off equipment with the muzzle. And then another thing that's very important for us is proofing the not necessarily proofing, but making sure that the dogs are, are, are odor-based searching. And I want to make sure that the dog is actually searching and alerting to, not alerting, but searching uh, and seeking human, not equipment. So that's another important piece of that too. And you can do that in the muzzle. So do a bunch of searches in the muzzle with uh, just the the human, no equipment to make sure that the dog is working for human odor and look actual, actually showing change of behavior on human odor, not just equipment like suits, hidden sleeves, whatever. Um, and then what we also do is we do a lot of searches to um, without a muzzle to someone behind a barrier. So we'll put like a decoy in a cage or a decoy on the other side of the fence or a high find something, you know, eight, six, seven, I don't know, tall, something tall so that the dog can't get up there and having the dog search without the muzzle on. And we want to see a huge change of behavior when they find that suspect, right? So we want to see the dog, if someone's behind a cage or behind a fence, we want to see the dog light up on that fence. Whether it's, you know, in prey or in aggression, I don't care, but I want the dog to get there. And like, like and, and I want to see that huge energy shift the moment the dog gets there, right? Um, so those are kind of like the things that we're doing. Um, that's a little bit more like searching wise. And then we're also doing a lot of like straight sends in the muzzle. We're doing a lot of straight, sends, um, and make, uh, with the decoy passive and really making sure that the dog is, is comfortable and target locking and giving their all full engagement into, uh, decoys in all sorts of situations. One thing that we've really come across is that a lot of people work passive, like very, like just still like this. You know, they're either sitting or standing in a corner or whatever, and they're just very still. But what happens is on the street, passive can be walking passively, right? So where the decoy is just literally just walking, minding themselves, a dog comes into the room, the decoy doesn't look at them or give them any sort of presentation. It's just completely ignoring them. We want to see the dog self-ignite into engaging that suspect in that situation. So that's do a lot passive decoy, but a passive decoy that's moving calmly and normally acting normal because all decoys act the same way. The dog comes in and they present or the dog comes in and they give a quick twi like twitch or there's an energy shift that goes on. Right. So it's very, very important that the dogs are self being someone and them building up their own. Sorry. Them building up their own 
um, energy and combustion in order to uh, bite the suspect or engage the suspect, not the suspect having to give some sort of reaction that then ignites the dog up. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And two th I thought I thought of a question while you were talking about this. Yeah. Are you teaching a primary target? Yeah, absolutely. So we've always done targeting and I was always kind of just like, and people would ask me and I'd be like, we just do, right? Uh, but then I heard Gary Bradshaw, I think on one of his podcasts or whatever a couple of years ago, and I totally stole it from him because it's a great, great concept. And it's easy for me to explain it in words. Jerry um, is a really good teacher. Oh, yeah. I, he's a college professor, I think. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, and I've noticed that in dog training, some of the best dog trainers uh, that are good at teaching other people were, you know, some sort of professor or teacher or something in their past life before they became a dog trainer. So Jerry is a good one. Another one, Joel Monroe is a Schutzen helper here in Northern California. He was a high school teacher and he's so good at explaining stuff. Very eloquent. Michael Ellis, Forrest Mickey or another one. But anyways, my point, I'm going on a side. side it's table. okay. I do that too. <laughs> my point is um, targeting, targeting. Jerry explains uh, it as he doesn't want the dog to have choice paralysis. And I've seen this before where pol a police officer sends their dog. The dog goes up there and the dog kind of does like this as he gets yeah. up to try to figure out like where he's going to go because he's so used to seeing the literally from like, like a Schutzen helper. Right. Um, so we teach the targeting because I think what that does is that gives the dog an aim point and they're like, Hey, I'm going there. I know exactly mm -hmm. where I'm going and I'm not going to, there's no reason to slow down. There's no reason to, think about it it's less thought involved people always think like oh i don't want i don't want i want my dog to bite the first thing it sees not think about where it's going to go that's what they think happens when you teach a dog targeting but in reality what i think i think targeting actually tr gets a dog that goes in faster harder stronger because the dog knows exactly where they're going and there's no yeah. thought that goes into it right? it just becomes muscle memory there's no thought at all and um and you can see it as a decoy when you're working a dog that doesn't have targeting, you can see how they slow down and they have to think a little bit more versus a dog that targets. It's like full steam ahead, muscle memory. They don't even, they are not even thinking at that point and they just boom, go, str go straight for their target spot. So yes, we teach targeting. We teach targeting um, in order to keep the decoy safe. Uh, we teach targeting in order to keep the dog safe. These dogs are working long, hard careers and we want to keep, keep it as less at least as least impact for them as possible and if the decoy knows where the dog is going to go it's much safer for everybody because they can catch the dog and absorb the dog correctly um we teach targeting so that we can do crazier shit in our training if we know where the dog is going to be we can push the limits a little bit more i can put a decoy on his knees i can put a decoy sitting down on the ground because i know the dog's going to target right um and then also police dogs are less lethal tools right and if the dogs start biting people in the stomach, in the face, in the neck, and all this sort of stuff, that <laughs> in the neck, yeah, that could kill somebody, right? Yeah. So it's very important for me that we keep these animals as less as less lethal tools. It's very important for me that we uh, promote the correct use of police dogs, and I think that targeting fits all those points, right? Um, so, what is the tar what is your primary target that you teach? So we teach primary target as the left bicep uh, on the front. On the back, we te teach triceps. Uh, so that's like our, our primary target if the dog has is looking from the back. And then um, our secondary targets is legs. Awesome. Typically like the knee. Do your dogs use training tools? Like are they allowed to go out with e-collars in the field? Yeah. So by policy oh, – I'll start. Uh, by policy – our police dogs aren't allowed to deploy without their e-collars uh, even on. And we honestly tell our canine handlers that they're not allowed to even have their dogs inside the cars without their e-collars on. And for me, it all comes down to um, liability. You know, if that dog gets out of the car, they have verbal control, right? But if the dog decides to take off after something and that prey overrides their control, which is totally possible with any high drive animal, I need to make sure that my handlers have a way to physically overpower their dog from whatever distance. And that's why we use an e-collar. It's our seatbelt, it's our airbag, it's our whatever you want to call it, um, in order to make sure that the animal, to ensure that the animal complies with all commands that are given. So we're, uh, most of our handlers run a prong collar and an e-collar on the street. Is that pretty standard or not really? Uh, Standard for us, I, I travel a lot and see dogs off leash with 
you know, handlers letting him go take a piss or shit off leash with no e-collar on. And I shit my pants every time I see that because, <laughs> yeah, your dog is fine right now, but all it, all it takes is one time. Anybody that has a high drive working dog knows exactly what I'm talking about. So yep. if you take your dog out to go potty without a leash on, you're always taking a gamble no matter what. What are the different types of police dogs? So we have single purpose patrol dogs. So those are dogs that don't do any detection. They're just uh, simply apprehension. We have dual purpose police dogs, which are typically apprehension and uh, some sort of detection. So either it's uh, gunshot residue, GSR dogs, gun dogs, whatever you want to call them, firearms dogs, whatever you want to call them, uh, explosives dogs or narcotics dogs. Um, and then we have single purpose detection dogs, which are either, again, gun dogs, explosive dogs or narcotics dogs. Um, and then some departments have like tracking tracking dogs that are all they all they do is track like missing people and stuff like that. Uh, but those are the, the typically what we are training is the dual purpose dogs, single purpose apprehension dogs and single purpose detection dogs. For the single purpose detection dogs, what breed are you working with the most? Malinois. I thought you were going to say labs, honestly. When I'm not against labs. For me, it's just harder to find a lab that fits what I'm looking for than it is to find a Malinois that has a shitty grip, is not a good bite dog, but still has really good hunt and good prey drive for the ball, right? Yeah, um, that makes sense. It's real For me, it's really, 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 really hard to find labs, pointers, spaniels, and whatever other breed you can think of um, that fit what I'm looking for in a detection dog because I'm so stuck on like the perfect dog that can hunt like a Malinois and that's typically a Malinois. So, um, it's possible. I have, I have a lab right now that hunts better than most Malinois. Um, my personal, uh, narcotics detection dog. And, um, but that, that's really hard to find. And I think it's because lab hunting lab breeders are breeding a little bit different than typically what we're looking for. And actually it's funny, the best labs that I've had are the ones that the hunting dog people are like, oh, this dog's too much. <laughs> he's a little too much, or he's a little too crazy. He's a little too wiry, that sort of thing. Um, but also that's the detection dog. I want detections that are detection dogs that are balls to the wall, crazy hunters, don't stop constantly going where there's some other people that like dogs that are a little bit more calmer and like meticulous in their detection. I don't want that. I want a dog that's balls to the wall, hunting their brains out and uh, a lot of detection people are like oh i want a dog's a little bit calmer because he might miss it if he's a little bit crazy but for me a lot of what our guys are doing are really really long searches um because of the area that we're in the tech capital of the world are we have a lot of bomb dogs and our bomb dogs have to do really really long sweeps and i've noticed that those dogs that are really like crazy little hunters can go a lot longer than the dogs that are really like calm and meticulous who kind of burn out and fizzle out a little bit quicker. What, what, um, traits are you looking for when you're selecting a dual purpose dog? And then what would then lead you to wash a dog? No, the, I, I kind of like laugh when you ask this, cause this is like, this is like, the, this is what everybody asks. And it's so, there's so much that goes into it. It can't even be, ha it can't even be explained in a conversation, but when it comes to a, let's talk about bite work. When it comes to a dog that's going to do apprehension, the biggest things that we're looking for is a dog that is extremely fiery. Um, and by that, I mean like they like turn on really quick, but more importantly, we want a dog that hunts hard and hunts long because most of the dogs that we're selecting for police work will have no problem on a straight send. You put someone in front of them, you tell the dog to bite, they are going to bite because they're prey heavy. We look for very prey heavy dogs. That's the most important thing for us. We want dogs with little aggression, a lot of prey. And the hardest part is having do finding dogs that will, you know, be able to do a two, three hour search off leash with a bunch of control in between and then find somebody and still have the want to ignite and engage them. Um, and so that over the past couple of years, we focus a lot more on finding those dogs that hunt long and hunt hard because that is what's ended up what's that is what's harder to find than a dog that bites really well and honestly i'll take a dog that hunts hard and hunts hunts hard hunt can hunt for a long time and hunts with a lot of pep in their step i'll take that over a dog with super 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 nice grips um because 
it, at the end of the day, when the dog bites a suspect, the suspect's not doesn't care whether the dog the full grip or like a whatever grip. But if the dog is searching for a long time, you they might have to call off the search, and then we don't we won't even have the opportunity to engage that suspect. Right? You can't bite what you can't find. Yeah. For me, that is something that's really got gone up a lot on our radar in the past couple of years. And there's a bunch of extra shit that we look for on top of that. We look for a dog that's extremely confident. We look for a dog that's environmentally sound. We look for dogs that, um, you know, have low uh, nerve thresholds. Like those are all things that we're looking for in our patrol dogs. So um, when it comes to bite work, that's definitely what we're looking for. Our perfect dog is a dog that has super powerful, super strong grips, a dog that is extremely confident, a dog with a low nerve threshold, and a dog that can hunt his fucking ass off forever. And if we could have that, that is our perfect dog. Similarly, in detection, when we're looking for a single purpose detection dog, we're looking for a dog that can hunt, 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 and a dog that's environmentally confident and typically social as well. Um, those are kind of like the things that we're looking for um, overall. Pretty much our detection dogs are a mini version of our uh, dual purpose dogs. They just don't, uh, don't have, we don't care about the grip or we don't care about the bite mechanics or anything like that when it comes down to it. There's a lot more that goes into it, but that's the kind of quick, quick and dirty of, of what we're looking for. Um, in order, in the situation of what does it take to wash a dog? Not yeah. much. We wash a lot of dogs. I think we kind of get a lot, a, a bad rap for washing a lot of dogs, but I don't give a fuck what other dog trainers say, because at the end of the day, they're not the ones going out there and putting their lives on the line for, with an animal. Yep. Uh, and there's one thing that can be said, and that's that we will never, ever sell a dog that we don't think um, is going to be successful on the street because at the end of the day, we're very close with our handlers. I think that's one thing that I've learned different from other police dog trainers is our handlers are like our friends. You know, anybody like, that follows my Instagram sees all the shit that I post on my story fucking around with them. Like they're, they're like friends. They're, they're like family to us. Um, you know, I literally spent my last Christmas with one of our canine handlers. So we're really, really close with all our handlers. Um, Show sure, so, you a real a real canine over here. Oh, that thing's so cute. What is that, Chihuahua? Yeah, it's Snooky. Oh my god, that thing is cute. Thanks. I don't think I've ever seen you post that. Oh. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, she hasn't had her debut yet. Oh my god, that's so cute. Is it long hair? Yeah, because the short hair ones are ugly. Look, you it's, just distracted him. Its eyes. Its eyes are so uh, bulgy. They're not usually as bulgy. Um, she does look kind of ugly right now. I think she's just she's just taking it in. So yeah, this is her. I'm gonna be breeding them probably. We'll see. That's so cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, starting a breeding program with mini schnauzers. I have mini schnauzers. I have two. really. Yeah, I barely post them too. Um, <laughs> but I really like, dude. There's something about a little dog. Like after having hella big dogs, they just you know, hit different. They hit different, dude. Little dogs are the shit. Like you can like. You know, I have my little dog next to me in the car while I'm driving. They can sleep in bed with you. Yeah. My schnauzers don't, they don't shed. So they're super nice to have in the house because they don't leave a mess. Like it's, they're, I love little dogs, dude. I think every mount, like working dog person always has like their little, little dog. dog. Yeah. Yeah. You need a little dog, right? For me, it was the mini schnauzers. I see a lot of working dog people have like Frenchies um, yeah. I had a, or I loved my Frenchie too. So I, little dogs and little dogs and working dogs, you got to have both. They go together. Yeah. And like. She's been sleeping with us too in bed and she loves going under the covers. So like sometimes we'll go to sleep and she'll be like up here and like by the middle of the night, she's literally right. all the way down, just like yeah. cuddled in. Like if we put her anywhere, she'll just kind of sleep there. Um, it's just a nice change of pace when you have to always be like on your working dog's ass, like do this, do that. It's just 100%. nice to have a chihuahua. I'm not going to train her. You know, she, she needs a recall. That's pretty much it. Maybe a sit if I get there. Yeah, um, sure. But it's so funny. Actually. I didn't know that you had mini schnauzers. Yeah, I had two. I have Paloma and Tonic. So. You have to post them. I want to see what they look like. Well, I'll post them today just for you. So what age range are most apartments looking for? A um, I would say anywhere from like 12 months to 24 months is normal. But we've also uh, put dogs on the street that are a little bit older. I've put three and four-year-old dogs on the street just depending on... Um, Honestly, we've had some dogs come through that are a little bit older on the three to four year old side that are fucking bangers, like some of the best dogs we've ever had. And we tell the agency like, hey, this dog's one year or two years older, but he's fire. And they're and they're look they're usually like, ah, like, you know, like we wanna they wanna get their money's worth, right? Yeah. 
Um, but then they see how nice the dog is and they're like, oh, fuck, we'll take it. Right? <laughs> I think it's totally against industry standard, but fuck industry standard. Like if the dog's really that nice, like, are you really going to let one year, you know, get in your way? Like most dogs retire with, uh, most dogs in our area only work five years. Um, so, you know, if the dog's three or four years old, five years ain't much, the dog's going to retire by the time they're nine, the latest. Yeah. And a good working Malinois at nine years old still works. Yeah. So, um, and obviously as a dog gets older, we stop doing a bunch of crazy shit with them, especially as they're seasoned. We just retired a dog that probably retired at like nine, nine ish, 10 years, years old. And, um, you know, he was a seasoned dog. Like there's, we pick and choose what scenarios we put him through. We pick and choose what, you know, situations we put them through in training just to keep, keep their, their body intact. Right. Cause their, yeah. their body is always a hundred percent there and their body can just start to deteriorate a little bit. So we just make sure to keep the dog in shape and keep the dog, um, keep the dog stamina going. But other than that, you know, that's, that's kind of, we play. So yeah, we would, I would say like 12 to 24 months is, is normal for our area. Yeah. That's what I've seen too. I think some dogs, I think it just depends on the dog for me personally, a year, is a little bit young, but there are absolutely dogs out there who at a year old are a lot more mentally mature and can handle and understand, you know, the situations that they're going to be put in. So it's super dog dependent. Absolutely. hundred percent. You're right. So what do you enjoy teaching the most obedience, protection or detection? Why? And then what do you enjoy? The least? Um, I would say probably my, my favorite for sure is obedience or control. Um, we just took over a new program this week, a new agency uh, in our police dog program. And, Congrats. Um, thank you. And we, the do- they're like been struggling with the verbal out for X amount of years. They can't verbal out their dog, whatever. And they literally came into one training session. By the end of the training session, the dog was verbal outing and recalling to the handler. Um, and I think that is like our bread and butter in the industry. So I think that's my favorite because it's pretty cool. Like where, when someone comes like, oh, my dog won't verbal out. My dog won't verbal out. I'm like, ah. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so I think for sure um, that's my favorite because I like seeing the quick change. And I like seeing the handlers go from like, oh, he won't do it to like, holy shit. Yeah. I guess my least favorite to train is probably, I would say my least favorite to train overall is probably probably tracking because it's what I have the least amount of experience in. So it's not it's not very fun for me because it's kind of like a little bit like imposter syndrome in a, in a sense. I'm kind of like, well, like, I don't know. I should be teaching this but not necessarily because I don't really have a lot of experience in it. So um, I can do like my, my fair share of tracking. I think I can train a tracking dog, but I can't be like, oh, I've trained this many tracking dogs that have found this many people like I I'm comfortable. Give me any dog and I'll make sure it's a tracker. Like, no, that's not me. You know, give me any dog and I'll make it by people. Give me any dog and I'll, I can put control of, on it. Right. But when it comes to tracking, it's the thing that I'm least um, knowledgeable. And I guess you can say, so I guess that's why it's my least favorite because I don't, I don't, it's not my thing. What are your short and long-term goals for your career for the working dog training, police dog, pet dog stuff? Um, for sure, my long term goal is to get more into the instructing. Uh, I think as I age, um, you know, I'm talking about 30, 40 years from now when I'm not probably as physically able to, you know, be around dogs, correct dogs, decoy dogs, do all that sort of stuff. Like, I want to be definitely more on the teaching side of stuff where it's more instru- instructor based. Um, I think like uh, that would be my long term goal because you can do that until the day you die as instruct, right? Um, I think my short term goal, I guess I haven't really necessarily thought about a short term goal. I guess my short term goal is just to further refine my company and make, sh- make sure that I'm putting equal amount of time to all facets of the company, pet dogs, you know, attraction dogs. I Oh, you know what? I would say our short term goal the company's short-term goal, my short-term goal, short-term goal is to start producing more dogs that we're putting on the street. Um, as you know, beat, um, breeding is hard, breeding is difficult, and breeding quality dogs is already hard enough. Breeding police quality dogs is a whole other thing. There's a lot of breeders in the United States right now that claim that they breed police dogs, and they're putting dogs on the street that should not be on the street, but they want to in order to, you know, better boost their business and be able to say like, Hey, you know, I breed police dogs. Like I won't play that game. Um, we've bred so many litters and out of those, so many litters, you know, a few select have been able to 
make it onto the street as police dogs. We're very, very hypercritical about our own shit. Um, we're very critical of dogs, period. And a lot of people don't like that about me, that how hypercritical I am about dogs and how willing I am to replace dogs, get rid of dogs. But one thing that I don't think a lot of people know is how hypercritical I am about our own dogs, the ones that we produce, because um, my name's on that. And I think in the police dog industry, you know, uh, people know like, oh, if you get a dog from Spectrum Canon, it's going to be a banger. And I want to keep that up, right? Um, the moment you start, and there's been plenty of times where, plenty of times, more than, there's more time, more, it's more likely that some uh, an agency contacts us and we're like, yeah, we don't have a dog available right now. Then, yeah, we do have a dog available right now. And the reason why is because we care so much about quality um, and quality is everything for us. I'd rather sell you no dog than sell you something that's not there. But you know that when you come and get a dog from us, it's going to be a banger. Um, so that for me is super important. And that's something that I definitely, definitely is my short-term goal is being able to produce dogs, breed dogs in-house that we end up putting on the street and our, meet all our quality, all our quality goals when it comes to putting police dogs on the street. So that's, that's, I guess my goal is, you know, finding, uh, is working our breeding program towards that way. And, and the thing is, is like, no matter like, it's not like once you reach that point, you're good because it's like, okay, you breed that one litter, like that one worked out, but then the next four litters are not reaching that. Right. So it's not like once you find it, it works. Like it's always going to be this way, but I at least want to, you know, stay committed to the breeding and, and keep going. It's really hard. Being a breeder is no joke. The health testing that gets that's involved is insane. Um, the amount of money that goes into that is insane. The highs and lows of, you know, health testing a dog and being like, well, fuck this dog has this pop up. Now I can't breed it. Right. Um, and then, you know, the actual raising of the puppies is no joke. And, you know, I think one thing that people don't take into consideration is the amount of time and effort it takes to own breeding dogs. Right. So I have two breeding females myself and like, they basically just take up space cause I'm not actively working them. Um, and you know, I have to feed them. I have to give them time. I have to you know, run them. I have to take them out and potty them X times a day. I have to do all this shit. So, I'm, and then, you know, I'm going to breed them once every two years. So in the meantime, they're just there. Right. So, um, you know, the, you talked earlier, you tell you have nine personal dogs. Like I'm right there with you. Right. Like it's no, I, I didn't, mean, I literally thought like you only had icon and maybe one or two more dogs that might pop in and out. I didn't realize you had so many. Oh yeah. I probably have, I don't even know how many I have seven, eight, nine, something like that. So, <laughs> You know, having all those dogs is, is is a lot of work, and it's definitely it takes a, a big mental toll. And I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I'm fucking done with breeding. Like, I'm gonna <laughs> some, someone else can give them more time and effort than than me, right? But it's hard. But that's my short term goal is to stay committed to the breeding and continue that. So, yeah, a common trend that I've noticed on here talking to other people, and I would say just talking to really highly accomplished people, people that their work is proven, um, is that they'll get heat from other people like, oh, you're too picky with dogs. And it's just like, okay, well, yes, that might be true. One, there's nothing wrong with that. And two, I might be picky with them, but look at what I'm producing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Look at what I'm achieving. Look at what I'm accomplishing, what the dog is accomplishing. Yeah. Um, and especially with a police dog, I mean, you should be picky with them. Yeah. There should be a, a lot of dogs that you're going through and until you find a dog that's fitting what you're looking for. Because again, just going back to a conversation we had earlier, they're – out on the streets with their lives on the line and then their fellow officers on lives yeah. on the line. Um, they need to be high quality dogs yeah. to get the yeah. job done. Yeah. hundred percent. And for me, it even goes deeper than that. Like I, I barely talk about the handlers like, Oh, like their life depends on it. I always talk. I'm like, they have wives. You're a police wife. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They have yep. wives. They have kids. Like those wives and those wives are going to be widowed. Those kids are going to have no father if, or mother, sorry, but are if, something happens to that handler because they're, you know, trying to make their dog successful in an engagement or trying to do shit that they shouldn't be doing, trying to help the dog out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it comes down to for me. It's an ethics thing. It's a morals thing. Um, and that's why, like, I, I think forever we will be a small time vendor compared to some of these big vendors that exist, but at least I can go to bed every night knowing that I put a quality product out on the street and that, um, that the dog I put out on the street is going to do what it needs to do when it comes time. So yeah, people I don't know some people sleep at night. I know. Right. Um, 
that's what I tell people too. Like, yeah, it's crazy. But I, I, you know, people will forever give me shit for, you know, going through dogs or people will always give me shit for, you know, not putting time and effort into dogs or being picky with dogs. But I could give a fuck. My buddy, well, uh, Will with Hayden Pro, like told me a couple years ago, like, you know, you stop trying to impress other dog trainers because they don't pay your bills. And he actually posted it on Instagram a couple of days ago. And uh, that's resonated with me really hard. And especially what that's for sure, like the pet dog thing. But when it comes to the police dogs, it's like, I don't give a fuck what anybody else says about being picky. Cause I, like you said, you know, I'll be able to go to bed at night knowing that I did the right thing and knowing that I put a good quality product on the street. So yeah, that's, at that's the end really of the day, people are going to talk shit regardless. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Uh, we have a shadow program so if anybody's interested in seeing what we do with our police dogs you can come out and do a two-week police uh two-week chunk of our um police dog school or handler course and during that handler course you'll be able to also go to our maintenance training Um, you can pick if you want to do like the beginning of our handler course the middle or the end based on what you want to see do you want to see basics do you want to see intermediate or do you want to see like the advanced stuff um, and then you'll be able to see detection. You'll be able to see a little bit of everything. So, um, we do that. If anybody's interested in kind of you know, day in the life, they can be with us for two weeks and follow us. We'll travel. Oh, that's so cool. I didn't know you did that. Yeah. You can travel with us all over Northern California and see what we do with our police dog program for two weeks straight. Um, we are currently revamping our Patreon. Uh, so we're putting, starting to put a lot of stuff out on the Patreon, um, so that you guys can see more longer in-depth stuff. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye on our Instagram. We're always posting classes. We're definitely moving more towards making our, club, our a lot of our classes more, um, you know, civilian auditor friendly. So if you're interested in coming and watching, we can definitely do that too. So I appreciate you bringing me on today. And I, if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can, Send me a DM, it's Spectrum Canine or That Boy Ricky on Instagram. Yes, Ricky's super fun to hang out with. He's a super cool guy, extremely knowledgeable. So thank you so much for coming on and we hope you have a good day. All right, take care, appreciate it.